So hi everyone, I'm Esther Collins and I'm Head of Learning at Towner in Eastbourne. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us this afternoon. On screen you'll see with me Sue McLean, who is a British Sign Language interpreter and she will be visible throughout the event and may take a short break later on. So Talking Loud is a series of events hosted jointly by Towner and the Delaware Pavilion in Bexhill. The talks aim to give you the opportunity to hear from leaders across the creative industries. Talking Loud is part of Southeast Creatives, which is a development and support program for small businesses in the creative, cultural and digital sectors across East Sussex, Kent and Essex. And this program is funded by the European Regional Development Fund. We'd like to say a big thank you to those behind Southeast Creatives, especially Sally Staples at East Sussex County Council and Philip Johnson and the team at Locate East Sussex. So a bit of housekeeping. Today's event will last between 45 minutes and an hour. Live captioning is running for the event and you can turn it on or off using your personal controls in Zoom. And please do excuse any errors in the transcription as it is an automated program. So that you can focus on the discussion, we won't be including any live online chat or Q&A today, but thank you to those of you who have pre-submitted questions. These have already been sent to Jenny and Amanda and they will re respond to those as part of their conversation. So I'm now going to introduce today's guests. So Amanda Parker is founder and director of Inc Arts UK, which advocates for the creative, contractual and economic rights of the UK's ethnically diverse arts sector workforce. Previous equalities, diversity and inclusion roles include her leadership of the BBC's recruitment and awareness campaign for the launch of BBC Radio One Extra and as Head of Communications for Directors UK, Amanda was responsible for overseeing the UK's first industry-wide research into gender diversity in TV directing. Amanda's advocacy includes representations to UK and European parliaments on behalf of cultural and creative sector workers, and UK-wide campaigns on anti-racist action in the arts and cultural sector. Amanda is on the Arts and Cultural Strategy Group for the COVID-19 London Government Task Force and the Advisory Board for the UK Coalition for Cultural Diversity. Amanda has been a trustee of Film London since 2000, sorry, 2016. She is a trustee of Intermission Youth and was the inaugural chair of Parents and Carers in Performance Arts in 2017. Amanda is director of the London Short Film Festival, is an RSA fellow and a CLAW fellow. And Jenny Williams, BEM. Jenny is director of Revoluton, which is Luton's Arts Council England funded Creative People and Places project. This is one of 31 independent projects around the country based in areas where there are fewer opportunities to get involved with creativity. Alongside this, Jenny is founding director of Take the Space, a creative agency set up in 2006 with the aim of enabling artists from black and British multi-ethnic backgrounds to take their space and tell their stories. At its core, Take the Space is committed to telling stories that are generally not seen and not heard and finding spaces that connect people with each other. Prior to this, Jenny held numerous senior positions within the arts and public sectors, including Head of Diversity Arts Council England in the National Office, Cultural Diversity Officer Arts Council England South East, Education and Community Director at The Kiln, which is formerly The Tricycle, and Arts Development Lead for both Mid-Sussex District and Wandsworth Borough Councils, as well as her first job in the arts sector as Fundraising Officer 
for English Touring Opera. Jenny was recently awarded a British Empire Medal in the New Year's Honours for Services to Culture and Creativity in recognition of Revoluton's digital programme through the pandemic. This is an honour she shares with the Revoluton team, Luton's fellow creatives and audiences. Jenny is currently a member of the Board of Trustees at Town at Eastbourne, so I have the pleasure of working with her closely on our programming and plans moving forward. I'm now going to hand over to Amanda, who are going to, uh, sorry, Amanda and Jenny, who are going to talk about inclusivity and diversity in the creative arts sector. Um, they have got some questions they're going to respond to, and I'm going to ask them the first one. So, Jenny, Amanda, do you want to join us? So, the first question is about the development of your careers. What drew you into the creative industries initially and how that has developed through production and advocacy into your current roles as directors of your own organisations? Uh, hi, uh, thank you for having me. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and it's always a pleasure to speak to Jenny in particular. Um, we often discuss makeup. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> um, so what brought me here? Actually, um, two things brought me here that I think are very indicative of people from ethnically diverse and underrepresented and marginalised backgrounds. Um, one is that it was a very um, circumlocutious route to get here. The other was it was almost by happenstance through not knowing how to do it directly. So from when I was very small, I loved dancing. I've been dancing since the age of six. Um, there was a kind of pivotal moment when I was around 17, where I applied for dance uh, schools. And when the letters came for interview, my parents got them because I was an idiot. I didn't realize I should go and pick up the mail as well. And they took them to the school and school basically said, um, well, she could be a dancer or there could be Oxford. Um, so I that, that stopped my career, you know, the thing that I loved was stopped before it started. I went on, I went to Oxford, I did lots of dance there, so I kind of didn't stop. But um, in terms of my first choice of career, would have been creative, wasn't, because other things got in the way. And that speaks to um, inclusion because my parents were definitely doing the doctor lawyer thing. Um, so if you, if you don't know, I mean, Jenny, you know what I mean. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> so that whole um, get a professional, career thing was my first experience and my first kind of barrier. Um, and the second thing, uh, why I'm here today, is also about a journey of inclusion because I've got here today through having left it to go and earn a wage, which is working in the BBC, working in broadcasting. I don't knock it. Um, I had some fantastic jobs, some great times from journalism, program making, arts programs, development, etc. But given that I wanted to dance, that wasn't what I was doing. I was going and earning a proper living in a proper job. Um, and it's only now that my children are a certain age, that I'm in a position of privilege in terms of financial comfort, that I can go, right, what can I do now about the things that matter to me? And what matters to me is to make a society that is equitable and just and to seek redress for those who don't experience the opportunities that some others do. So that's a kind of long way of saying it's by not being allowed in. Don't go <laughs> you know, so much of what you said resonates and um, even in our previous conversations it does as well. But in a nutshell, um, my career is very linear on paper. You know, you look at it and you think, yeah, OK, went to university, I did arts, I did history, I did uh, theatre studies and history. And then you look at my CV and then I land a job in the arts. But what's missing is the kind of the knowledge that there were jobs in the arts, the knowledge that I could actually get one, and finding out how to get there in the first place. And that took a long time when I finally got that first job. And that you know and I went from there to the tricycle which was the most profoundest experience of my career because 
I got to work in the London Borough of Brent at the time. It was the most diverse borough in, the, in, in London. And I got to work with extraordinary makers, you know, a diversity of makers, diversity of audiences. And I saw how work, really great work happens. And, and I thought that the rest of the art sector was like that. So when I left and I turned up in all these other places and it wasn't diverse, it wasn't inclusive, it wasn't a diversity of artists, it was a real surprise. But there was this, this linear and then there was a point where it all stopped. It all stopped for me. And whether you call it the glass ceiling or whether you call it prejudice or whatever you want to say, it stopped. And, and I set up my own consultancy in 2006 because I needed to do the work, as you were saying, I needed, I needed desperately to see a fair and just cultural landscape. I needed to hear stories that meant something to me, to my family, to my kids. And so I thought, well, I have to do it myself then. And that's where Take the Space came from. Very intentional, you know, the, the title, Take the Space. I was there to say, I want to take my space in the cultural landscape. And isn't it interesting that you can only do that at a certain point in your career? And maybe that's generational because I watch young people coming up and I hope to God it is generational and not that they just haven't reached the glass ceiling yet, but I watch um, other makers coming up and, go, and I just think, wow, do it. They're doing it already. They are um, running their own businesses. They are shaping their own curatorial practice. Um, and it's absolutely amazing to, to see. But mm. so when I started out, I mean, I remember now, I remember thinking I'd really love to be a reviewer of dance. And it was Judith Mackerel and she was doing all of it and she's still working. So it's like there was only one dance reviewer yeah. that was taken. And then there were the people who wanted to be directors. And I could see that job. Oh, I see what a director is. But you don't see when you don't come from those dialogues, when you are not part of those conversations or that learning, you don't actually know what the sector looks like let alone what's in it. So I think take the space is really exciting because you're not just saying take the space, you're also going and make it whatever you like. Mm. Don't worry about what's there. What do you want to do, which is beautiful. Yeah, and I think what I'm really interested in is that both you and I are founding directors and there's this really interesting article I read and I wonder if it resonates with you, that when you, when you found your own organisation, you do it because there's a gap and you do it to fill a specific gap. And somebody said to me the other day, how long are you gonna do Take the Space for? And I said, well, as long as there's a need for me yeah. to fill that gap. As long as that space needs taking. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really significant to me that I spent some years, um, so, I usually gloss over the kind of communications background. I've done lots of communication roles, both in the arts and elsewhere. And I got to a point where I went, I could sell you a pub. I could sell <laughs> anything. I, I did a job recently where I did uh, the uh, words to a grime piece. I was writing grime lyrics. I mean, come <laughs> Well, I know how to do it so I can hear and I can I can do it. And I just thought, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? When actually what what you always keep doing in the words and the communication that you choose to make is to go, who's not here? Yeah. yeah. Come on in. This is for you as well. And if I'm doing that on behalf of other organisations, why the hell am I not doing it for the whole sector? Just make the dialogue, make the space mm. right in and create that place of welcome. For sure, for sure. So it leads on nicely to this question about what motivates you, what, um, what I love this question, what most motivates you on a day-to-day -day level, what gets you out of bed? <sighs> Do you know, it's funny, that question this week lands so heavily for me because I've just been in a very bruising situation um, where I've been going, I should step away, professional situation, I should step away, I should, I should just let it be, know which battles to fight, step back. 
And somebody asked me that, what is motivating you? Why are you, are you, you know, why can't you let it lie? And I just thought, it's justice. It's justice that motivates me. It's not the money. It's not even reputation. If you want to slag me off or, or doubt my um, motives, that's, that's your prerogative. But please be fair, be fair, be kind. Yeah equitable justice is almost like a it's almost like a uh, trigger word for me at the moment I'm so fired up for making sure that people have fair chance and due process um yeah totally that but it's different for you isn't it because you are also creative well um I, I well I, I I like to think I am um but I'm not sure that uh that that I've been as creative as I would have liked to have been. You know what I mean? I think that part of the work that I've done at Take the Space and continue to do is that, um, and I don't know whether this resonates with you, that actually in order to do the work that I long to do, I have to make the space, I have to create the environment because it's not there. It's beginning to be there, I can see it, but it's not there, um, you know, I called myself a producer for many years and then I stopped because I thought, well, I, I am now again in Revolution, which I, is fantastic. But for Take the Space, I stopped because I thought I'm producing work up to a glass ceiling for the artists I'm working to, 15,000. But I can't do a major tour. Um, I can't do this fantastic because the environment wasn't there. And I spent a lot of time, you know, nudging, creating manifestos around just culture, it was called about actually trying to advocate for our space in the cultural sector so yes and isn't I'm that creative but not as creative as i would have liked to have been and isn't that difficult because i i am still you know almost two years in with Carts, really conflicted mm. by that challenge in ethnically diverse creatives having to also be EDI professionals at some level or the other. Uh, so when I talk to creatives, I basically say, and I absolutely mean it, I'm in this space so that you don't have to, so that you can focus on your creative practice and you don't have to worry about um, the uh, staffing levels or who's on the board or what governance processes they have in place or what actions they need to do to decolonize their practice or any of the other stuff that impacts on you. I am really clear, you know, my, my, my dreams of ballet are long gone. You know, I have no um, underlying real desire to be the maker. And that's because makers like you have had to do both. And then people are surprised that you haven't done the tour or you haven't done the major exhibition. It's like, mate, you were doing two jobs all the time. You're doing EDI and you're doing your creative practice because of the systems. Yeah because of the environment. Absolutely. Um, it does now mean, it does now mean that I understand the environment in a way that, you know, I look back and I think if you understood, as I do now, across policy, across practice, across what has worked in the past, programmes have worked to diversify the um, arts and heritage environment. I've seen it, I've delivered it, I've worked on them you know, put them together, I've seen them to fruition. And, and now I hope is the time where we go. We've learned all the lessons, we've done it, we've been trained, we've got the case studies, and now we have the will. And that's what I'm waiting for. The minute the sector has the will, we're there. We're really there. I think we have the will. <laughs> too much? <laughs> too soon? I only work with people who now have the will. I think okay. that's the difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because... And do you, back at you, you can't ask me that question. Well, you know, I hear you. The lessons have been learned. This, this last year has been phenomenal in lots of very, very hard and sad and traumatic ways, but a phenomena nevertheless in looking at humanity and humankind human need and what humankindness means it's been 
phenomenal. I choose that word. With yeah. And at the same time, we've learned the lessons, we've we've shone a light, we've raised understanding, and I hope to goodness we are not still, you know, talking about you you what you know now compared to what you know then you are still carrying those two jobs do we demand or require the same of people who i can think of um, artistic directors who are artistic directors two years out of university not because they've learned the lessons or yeah. they've, they've just been given license to navigate the space they've been given trust support funding opportunity um, the benefit of the doubt, um, the space to make mistakes, the space to make rubbish work sometimes, you know, and to go away and lick their wounds and come back and go back on the horse. So do I think that the sector is up for the whole change? Like you, I'd like to think so. I think probably yes. I think almost certainly yes. What I wonder is um, are we really ready? Are we really ready? H have we really got the appetite? Because yeah. we know, don't we? This is about power. So let's talk to those people. Are you prepared to go? Actually, I'm going to forego three skiing holidays. I'm going to take two. Or that third child, they're not going to go to private school. <laughs> it's like... If we're talking about power, are we ready for seeding power? Are, are others ready for seeding power? Are we ready to create new spaces? Yeah, and yeah, do it for sure. I'm really, I tell you what I'm really excited about, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm meandering all over the place. I'm really excited about um, a headline I saw the other day. Um, banks in central London are... Uh, renting some of their offices out people their their staff are being invited to work um partly remotely so as a result they have more desk space and as a result of that they might be able to do things very differently and i i have this kind of mad image in my head oh my gosh what <laughs> the seventh floor of the HSBC tower is it going to be ducky is it going to be something completely unexpected that would be amazing wouldn't it and that's just on a kind of remote working office space perspective as a result of covid but there's so much more we can look at in terms yeah. of post-covid for happens. sure which leads us into the next I'm, go, I'm hopping on the questions but this one the changes and issues which have become apparent or urgent as a result of covid yeah so i mean that that is for me a really beautiful evident change mm. people are going to have to think differently mm. question is how differently are they prepared to think mm. the office that's the space that's the, the the practice of working what about when your chief exec is 23 and doesn't speak receive pronunciation and speaks how they would speak to their friends, and you have to learn the language of their language. Mm. To the other way around, are we ready for that? I, I, and you know, whatever else, this uh, this COVID thing, whether we're through it or halfway through, who knows? But last year was so significant um, that the shift is 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 more than COVID, isn't it? It's societal, it's cultural. We're seeing, um, you know, one, one of the things that I will take away with me from what happened last year with Colston, with the amount of books that were read from black writers, that they blew off the shelves. What I would take away is I have to be optimistic, you know, I have to be positive about what's happening next, is that arts and culture Arts and heritage came centre stage. And some of the ideas that you and I might have talked about, decolonisation, um, we might have talked about microaggressions, all of this is now everyday currency. All of these conversations are mm -hmm. understood. And I think that could, that's a really good thing. Yeah. I think for our industry, 
to have it understood in such a way that our statues, the stories we tell of ourselves, the past is so important today. And as, as you know, somebody engaged in heritage for a long time, we've wanted to say this for a long time and suddenly it's really clear. That is so true that that even before we, well, that, that part of the change, the first part of the change is to have common language and understanding. And that's what we have, isn't it? Yeah. It's really exciting. What else do you think, um, what do you think stays? What else stays? Language, understanding, the, 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 the common vernacular, that's understood. What else? What else do you think? Well, I quite like uh, the distances in the queue. Can we keep that there? <laughs> I'm loving just never going to a physical supermarket. Yes. Just one. For our cultural institutions, you know, um, this is pivotal, I think, because so many of our organisations made the Black Lives Matter statements. So many of those institutions made that statement and are, are talking about not racism, not prejudice, they're talking about anti-racism, which is action. Absolutely. And um, are we allowed to think that maybe this is the change that we've been, are we allowed to think that this could possibly be the significant shift that we've been waiting for? So I, I, well, I feel completely, not just allowed, but absolutely diving in two feet into feeling that this is a moment of change for that. I absolutely think that. Yeah. Uh, I think maybe two weeks ago, maybe less, we launched uh, Unlock, In Carts Unlock, which we basically took as many as, I, I, I must stop saying all, because who knows how many there were, but yeah. as many of the statements, the recommendations, the manifestos, the asks, the demands that were made over the last year, predominantly by marginalised and underrepresented people. Um, and we pulled them all together and we basically grouped them into what, what themes kept coming up. And we looked at all those asks and turn them into a toolkit which basically gives you those recommendations and allows you to set a time scale for you to do it. So actual, it's, it's in my mind, the answer to, we are feeling totally engaged with this dialogue, what can we do? Yeah. We hope to have given a, what can you do? So In Carts Unlock is, a, is over 120 actions. Um, and I think it's important that it's, not a call out space because like you said those commitments were I think I deeply believe totally meant yeah. totally, you know I, I would say that all who put black squares out absolutely meant it that they stood in solidarity um, and that whole experience was so bruising to hear that solidarity ain't enough so giving people a set of here's what you can do giving people the space to do that with privacy, but also answering the sector's demand around transparency. Who's doing what, how mm. long we can tell those stories with, with people being confidential within the process. We can tell trends, we can see patterns, we can tell over time what people are doing. And I'm really excited by that. I feel very, it's had a great reaction. It's yeah. lots of sign up. Um, and I think it's a great offer. Obviously, I would. Yeah, it's a fantastic piece of work. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> I can claim that. I won't claim it because a lot of work went into it. And it actually stands on the advocacy of all those groups who've been working for years. Like you say, can we dare to hope that this is a moment where people, I think we can. Exactly. And say it and tell you exactly what you need to do if you're not sure. Having said that, We've said that. So do you think the sector is very different from a uh, wider society with regard to anti-racist action? You see, um, 
I think that the sector is actually at a, and the, the answer is I don't know, but what I do know is I think that the sector, the arts and heritage sector is at a pivot moment. And it's either gonna take that moment and continue because arts and heritage creates culture. Mm. It creates culture. The stories that we tell of ourselves, the way that we interpret our past and bring it into our present. So I um I always say there's a clue in the word, isn't there? The clue. Yeah. <laughs> culture. For sure. And you know, th this is this is May, and this is the the a year ago we had the biggest global civil rights movement the world has ever seen. And for me, it's about, well, yep, that happened. And what do we do now? And what do we do now? How do we actually continue the conversation? How do we continue the work? And for my part, what I really hope is that the lessons that we've learned in the past the lessons that we've learned about what works, what doesn't work, how it looks, what success looks like. And I count myself within that storytelling and a lot of my colleagues along the way who have done the work, who have been here for a long time and like it did self campaigning, advocating, delivering the work. And my worry is, is that that work is not archived. It's not documented. You won't see the work that you know, some folks have done, but that knowledge is there. And I, I, I talk to my buddies a lot about it and say, it's like a baton of knowledge that we've got to pass on. And, and, I, and I really hope we find ways of passing on the knowledge. Um, I did a project uh, some time ago. It's one of my favorite projects that I've done. And it was called, What Difference Does Difference Make? And it, um, it, it was, um, it was around the 40 year anniversary of Nassim Khan's um, what, um, The Arts Britain Ignores report. And she was the first, for those that don't know her, Nassim Khan was the first head of diversity. I was the fourth, but, <laughs> and she wrote this report, The Arts Britain Ignores, 40 years previous. And that was the moment where, you know, you start to make change happen, it takes a long time. But there's a body of work, there's a body of expertise that we must not lose. So, so one of the uh, pre-questions we got was about what should artists do? What's, what's the role of the artist in, in, um, in the wake of Black Lives Matter and yeah. what practitioners do? And I think you're, you're answering one around make sure you do the homework not just an acknowledgement of what's come before, but an understanding of what's come before is absolutely vital to inform your work. Not least sure. um, see off the uh, opposition effectively, because you'll see there's a trend, you'll be able to spot them, see what others have done to deal with that. Yeah. Something amazing and different by all means. But I think that's one, um, and I hope just, thinking about that question that we've also maybe not answered, but teased out the, the, the real conflict between doing the work and the EDI work. I am very much of, of the space where I wish that we didn't have to do the both. Um, and, and as you said, the doing the both may have affected your ability to be fully creative in the way that you've wanted to. Yeah, who knows, yeah. And yeah, so, I know that doesn't that doesn't answer all of the question, but I'm just aware that it's a bit of the answer. A bit of what you can do is know what comes before, yeah. what has been successful before. Yeah. And I would also say collaboration, my word, we are easily picked off because we are in few numbers if we go into spaces on our own or in small groups, find fellowship. You know, I, I often talk about the um, political parties where you know that they will never spend time with each other socially in any shape or form. Mm. But when there is a three line whip, they all come out and they go, yep, what he said, what she said, because they absolutely work in unison to get 
common purpose progressed. And we need to be better at that. We need to actually build those collaborations and those communities and not be siloed. Agreed. And I would love to see for any organisation, any artist making work to archive the work. Don't throw away your posters. Don't throw away your programme. Don't throw away your work. You know, archive it. Put it on, you know, we can do that nowadays with this lovely technology that we've got. And we must build our archives, our creative and cultural archives, so that we can understand the practice that's gone before and build and build and build. So another question that we had was, um, <laughs> this one feels like it's, it's not so much to us, it's to the Arts Council. Um, Arts Council often backs opportunities that are age restricted to young only. Um, and other people need those same opportunities. And why does ACE continue to exclude others or, or rather focusing on that young and emerging narrative? Um, why does Arts Council? I don't think we can answer what Arts Council do. I don't think we can speak for Arts Council. But we can talk about what you can do within a system that tends to do that. And again, this is where if you are emerging talent, it would be wise to work with those who've come before. You know, there is a, there is a um, virtuous circle of mutual help and growth. If you lean on someone who's walked a similar path to you and maybe not got as far as you've had the opportunities to, but your practice and theirs will be amazingly better informed if one has the wisdom of experience and one has the appetite for reimagining and reversioning. Yeah, I mean, intergenerational work is the bomb, isn't it? It's so fantastic. The, um, the, the, what I would say to the question questioner is that the Let's Create strategy from Arts Council is fantastic in my view and may address some of those things, but, you know, I can't really comment on that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's probably a question that they need to put directly to ACE. But I think that does touch on resilience, because we, we want to reflect on um, how we make ourselves and how one can make oneself resilient. Um, there is a major issue around young representation in the arts post-COVID, and I think that we must also be mindful that young people are most likely to have been the folks being made redundant or the folks who are not going to have their jobs back post COVID. So we must also pay due attention to that life cycle of creativity, especially from young black and brown communities. We want to see representation, you know, and create those opportunities for that talent pipeline. So yes, there is there is a, a need to invest in in all ages and particularly the young. I think they've been really kicked from this this COVID thing. And and will be a huge loss. Uh, not just now, but it means that there is potentially a massive pocket of loss in five years, ten years. Yes. If we lose them now, which is what that, that mutuality, intergenerational work. I think is is a potential gain. It's not the only one, but if you feel, if you're one of those artists that feels like, God, the Arts Council only ever interested in young people, and you're one of those young people that thinks, well, I haven't got a chance because I'm never going to get work. I'm just going to go and get a regular job elsewhere. Then you're both saying a similar thing. You guys, <laughs> you know, it's good. That, that there is real synergy to be had in pulling those conversations together. We should also talk about care, shouldn't we? Care. Yeah, because this stuff takes, you know, takes its toll, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. You holding two jobs, um, us hearing, holding space, testimony, etc. All of us, um, in the words of one of my trainers, swimming in the sea of racism, that we're all in the sea, it's the same sea. Um, but for some people, we've got, you know, weights on our ankles. So it's a harder swim for some people. And I think 
when we talk about resilience, we have to talk about care. Mm. One and the same, not just self-care, but I deeply believe individuals should now, after last the last year, understand that you can and should and must and ought go to employers, go to big employers and ask, what care provision do you put in place for people? Because nobody can be under any illusion that this stuff isn't heavy. Mm. If you're engaging with diverse creatives, what's the extra provision do you put in place to make sure that that is as welcoming and supportive as you can for them? Um, lots in unlock, loads of recommendations. Oh, for sure, yeah, for sure. And I think as you were saying that, I was thinking actually because, you know, I, I, I work for myself, so I don't have an employer to ask for my well-being. So I have to ask myself, Jenny, how are you looking after yourself? And actually over the years, um, I found ways of really, really looking at, after myself. And a lot of it is from doing the work, it comes back to that thing about resilience, isn't it? Doing the work that gets you out of bed, doing the work that really, you know, is making a tangible difference. Um, I love working with artists. I love working with creatives who are telling stories that resonate with me. And I love seeing my peers grow as artists, as makers, you know, so it, it, it's it's interesting what care looks like yeah. when you work on your own as well actually so there's some care in uh, following your passion following your passion following your passion nice so what i love this question and it's a biggie and this one is about what demands and spaces should black arts practitioners make and take up given continuing systemic racism in the arts and cultural sector. Uh, the lack of real change or the part of decision makers in the wake of Black Lives Matters, along with a discredited government report on disparities, etc. <laughs> That's a biggie. That's like one of those um, dreams. Could you repeat? I'm so sorry, Amanda. Could you just repeat that question, Jenny? Because it was quite a long one. It was a long one. Are yeah, yeah. Ready? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so what demands and what spaces should Black arts practitioners make and take up given continuing systemic racism in the arts and cultural sector? The lack of any real change on the part of decision makers in the wake of Black Lives Matters, along with a discredited government report on disparities. That question is like, um, I don't have them anymore, thank God, but I used to for years have um, the dream where you are going into your finals exam, your A-levels, and that you get this question that you go, huh? <laughs> I haven't revised for this one. It's that's quite a that's like an essay. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna unpack it. So oh. demands of black creatives, what can they do? Where is their agency? So unlock absolutely looks at all of the demands people made and says. OK, organisations, pile in, set a time. We'll check in Ofsted style. Individuals, freelancers can, should, ought, must absolutely go to whatever space they care to, whether that's social or private, and ask of those organisations, hey, you, Mr Black Square poster, are you signed up? Are you also committing to being made accountable to the promises you made. So there's a thing that takes the weight off you. You can nudge it on them and go, we sit, we notice you did the black squares. Are you also doing the response? This is the thing that you said you wanted, right? Also though, within Unlock, there are riders. There's the anti-racism touring rider developed by Eclipse and others. Um, there are lots of other 
preset statements, conditions that individuals, freelancers can absolutely say, when I engage with this cultural practice, can you meet these conditions? Just would love to ask that in a, in a useful way before I sign on the dotted line. Beyond that, beyond the engagement, contractual engagement or the toolkit engagement, that's where I think it gets a bit tricky and personal. And I would say, choose your activism with care. So some people are really very activated in a, what I call a burn down Babylon way. Some people want to storm the gates, smash them down and thank God for them. We need those people. But we also need the Matagaris who are prepared to sleep with the enemy. We also need the diplomat who's prepared to pick up a phone to the minister. We also need the banker who doesn't really want any part in it, but will put a big wad of cash, you go and make it happen. Where individuals find themselves in that, in that kind of field of advocacy, because in my opinion, it's all advocacy, it's all towards common purpose, is absolutely the individual's prerogative. And I'm reluctant to say you must, you ought to do yeah. absolutely your call. But we do be looking at the Race uh, Disparities Commission. There is an urgent need to reflect a narrative that is inclusive, welcoming, and acknowledges not only are we already here, we love it here, here being in the creative and cultural space, and so does everyone else love us here. Not The UK is not full of people who are terrified of hearing about slavery or get really uncomfortable about thinking about the impact of the legacy of slavery. That's not the picture of the UK that I know. Agreed. So we just need to think about, you know, how do we do that collectively? How do we go? It's okay, it's cool, it's all right. Well, um, and at the same time, make a, make a very proactive response to that what do you think yeah and I totally agree with you and I think that you know that actually a, a lot of folks find um our shared heritage fantastically interesting and it's a shared heritage and we gotta have a shared narrative but I I also think that I read this question and I felt really sad and I felt really sad because I thought to myself I don't want folks, especially younger makers, creatives, to feel hopeless about where we are. And it's really important that this is not a hopeless situation. It's really important that there is also the other narrative. Yes, there is a discredited report. And yes, we are still fighting for change and all of the things we just spoken about. And guess what? There is also another fantastic story yeah. that we are having conversations that mean something. Organisations are going to use that toolkit. Organisations are really saying we want to make the difference. The shift has occurred. And guess what? If you look 40 years ago to where we started, the Arts Britain ignores that I spoke about earlier, to where we are now, progress is happening. It's not happening fast. As James Baldwin said, how much of my time do you need? Yes, <laughs> of course, there is still work to be done. But what I just want to say to you, ever ask this question, please don't lose hope. Well, it is a discredited report, you know, the clues. Yes. It is a discredited report. Please don't lose, and also keep making the work. But actually, when, as we all have been, certainly I have been slumped across my desk, thinking, I can't do this anymore. I can't fight anymore. But actually, where we have to go back to is our passion, is the work, is creativity, is actually saying we're going to make the difference in our cultural landscape by doing it. So the fantastic Amanda Huxtable, a uh, former artistic director of Eclipse. I know, yeah. Creative practice herself, um, said to me once, whilst we're busy fighting, we're not making. And that really resonated with me. It's like, by all means, 
join if you i mean that the, the fight analogy is is for debate but join the join the march by all means but don't lose sight of what you came for because that's yeah. where the magic is that's where the change is you know that amazing i mean there are millions of examples but one most high profile that i think of too actually yinka shunibare and steve mcqueen the exhibition of all year tens in the country my word what a beautiful piece of art and and that speaks volumes about yeah. inclusion you only have to go into the space and go okay this is what britain looks like whoa yeah um, and yinka shunibare going african textiles uh, Georgian history. There you go. Look at yes. that. <laughs> Love it. It's beautiful. So don't lose sight of the work. And, yeah. and it's a discredited report. And we're already here. Nothing to worry about. Nothing to see. It's a shared history. And I think one of the things um, is that I would ask for any, if there's any organisations watching this or whatever, as a individual maker, as an organisation, as a creative, you know, in the infrastructure, make yourself clear that you want to work with creatives. Stand up and say, come and work with us, because I found it wearing through my career, trying to find my allies, trying to find folks that want to work with me, were interested in the work that I produce, is interested in taking that relationship further. So it, it is about being really, really clear. So that touches on that final question that we haven't addressed um, about finding ethnically diverse artists to centre stage um, and how to pursue this. And you've answered it really. First of all, articulate and amplify your yes. desire to work with those artists. But I'd also go further. I would also say, why are you thinking just about the artists? We're in the Southeast, people. If you're thinking about the artist because your team isn't diverse, think about your team. Yeah. Do something there. Right, I've popped back up because we've got to the end of our discussion, um, but I want to say a huge thank you to you both. I found your conversation really inspiring and I've really enjoyed being drawn into a kind of conversation about how we build a perspective together that both stretches way back into our joint history and cultural history and can begin to find the right spaces and the right language around moving forward together into something that is a different shape and a different look to the spaces that we occupy at the moment. And that's something that um, we're really excited about you know, beginning at least to start to look at how we work to more together um, in a in a sort of broader sense of who we are as organisations, and as you've just said, like who who makes us up as well, and and about what is the work and where does that work happen? So um, I think from a towner perspective, e equaling uh, Jenny's enthusiasm, I think we. We, are, we recognise we're at the very beginning of that conversation, but it's, it's an exciting place to be. So thank you for that. Um, so yeah, I'm going to wrap up the event. Uh, so just to say thank you to Amanda and Jenny, but also to everyone who's joined us here this afternoon. And thank you for your time. And yeah, as I said, I hope you found the event as inspiring and exciting as I have. Um, once this uh, event is over, we'll be sending out a short survey to all members in the audience um, just to capture your feedback on the event. So it'd be really great if you can take the time to answer that. And we will be posting up a recording of the event um, that will probably go up in the next weeks. But definitely we're actually on event seven out of a series of eight. So definitely by the time all of those events have taken place. We'll have the full series, uh, the recordings of the full series available on the Towner website. 
Um, and I'm really excited to just since about an hour ago be able to announce what the last of that series of eight talks will be. So that will be next Thursday, the 13th of May at two o'clock. There'll be an in conversation event between Legato Chocola and Scotty, um, who both work in theatre and performance. So I think that's going to be a really lively and engaging and uh, well, it's going to be in a yeah, really brilliant event. So I do hope that all of you can make it. So thanks again to our guests and everyone who's uh, joined us today. And also just to say uh, both from the Delaware Pavilion and from Tanner Eastbourne that we're really excited to be able to welcome you back into our buildings on the 18th of May. So we're really looking forward to seeing people then. And uh, if not online in the gap in between. So. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.